And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and once again, for the first time in over a year, it is the return of the Big Dice Panel. This time around, we have, a, we have a whole lot of supers going on, a whole lot of capes going on. And I have not one, not two, not three, but four good brothers back in here. We have, fresh off the heels of the development of Ascendant, the, 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 greatest, the greatest crossover that no, that no one knew they wanted. <laughs> um, we have the Archon himself, Alexander Macris. Coming to us from Hello. from the from the wonderful world of Metahumans Rising, we have T. Dave Silva. Hi, hi, hi! Coming to us from the from his own spin on the on the D on the D twenty end of supers, we have Mr. Guthrie Ward. Hello. And last but certainly not least, coming from coming from the world of of um of. X Men meets Titan Effect meets full meets full on Weebery. We have the we have the one and only Christian Nome. Hi. <laughs> All right, how's everybody doing today? And I I know we had to, I I know we had to um call an audible and do and do this right in the middle of what my buddy across the pond calls Happy Treason Day. It's only treason if you lose. <laughs> Oh, good. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Um. So, one th one thing that I one thing that I'd wa I'd want to um, I'd want to start out with, because I've I've already I've already more or less covered the hum covered the humble beginnings in one form or another. When, in the times that I've had you on, but I want but I'd like to op I'd like to open with the following and. There's been there's been some um, scubbery about about the difference between a superhero game and a supers game. Um, do it. Do any of you think that there, that that it's that it's a splitting hairs distinction, or do you think that there's a distinct difference between the two? Well, I, I think uh, you're going to have to give us more context there, just so so I have a better understanding of of the. Like, wh how are people defining these two things? Um, the b now when I've when I've asked around about it myself, I've gotten a lot of variation as the, as what tends to happen with jo with genre debates, but it tends to be that soup that um a superhero game is focused mostly on, for lack of a better term, cape shit, whereas a supers game has soup has um characters with. Um, superhero like abilities, but it isn't trying to go for the t for the trappings of superheroes. So, like Marvel superheroes versus Amp. I guess that's one. I guess that's one way to put it. And there's been there's been debate about whether or not this whether or not this kind of thing is splitting hairs or not. I think it's a valid distinction. The because you can do a game with people that have superhuman powers that doesn't in any way feel like a comic book, mm -hmm. um, and and you can do a game that uh, actually has relatively mundane people but nevertheless still feels like a superhero game, um, just because the genre tropes are so different. And to the extent that the game is trying to emulate genre tropes with its game mechanics, they're going to end up being really different games. And I think. You know, if you actually look at various "quote unquote" supers or superhero games, you end up seeing that some of them are really supers games and some are superhero games, and uh, they they don't really feel the same when you play them. If if you look at the uh, Code Eight, um, that's a very supers orientated, um, you know, movie, whereas it's not superhero or superheroic at all. Which movie? I missed what you said. Yeah, Code Eight. It was really good. Code Eight, yeah. And yeah, we see the same thing in comic books too. Yeah, I'd um, 
It's a, it's actually interesting that you that you bring up um, comic books because well for one, um, in the in the golden age there was a, there was a whole lot of variety when it came to when it came to comic books. It wasn't solely dominated by superheroes. It only that only kind that only kind of happened because of um, well you can you, well yeah, it's free code. yeah well the well the code was a response to Frank Wortham's douchebaggery. Um. Yeah. So, right. But writers were uninhibited; they could do whatever they wanted pre-code. Yeah. So there, there was more variety. And then, in, then in the um, br then in the Bronze Age, because of the fact that pe that there were interesting stories that people wanted to do that the code didn't want, they started to loot. They started to lose their pull. Um. And I'd say I'd say nowadays ev everybody everybody um self-regulates, so the code is pretty much dead. Yeah, so there was a <laughs> uh, there was an interesting thing that happened towards the end of the Silver Age, mm -hmm. uh, and it, if anyone knows this story better than I am, please feel free to correct me. But uh, it's like the the FDA or some some faction of the government came to Marvel Comics and says, "Hey, we want you to do a a, a comic book issue about drug use," and Marvel's like, "Well, we can't do that underneath the comic book code, right? It prevents that." So there's like an issue of Spider-Man that is published without the code because the U.S. government asked them to do this story. I right? knew. About, I think that was. I knew about what? the. I knew about the Spi the Spider-Man story that was pub that was published even though the code even though the code um, said even though the code said no, um, but I did I didn't know that the U.S. government had been, had been involved in that. Yeah, they had, like, prompted this story, and I, I'm not sure to what degree. Like, I don't think they were, like, sitting there, like, well, this is what the story has to be about, and, like, dictating content or anything. They said, we want a story that addresses this issue, and we think that you have a good vehicle to do that. Mm -hmm. Right? <clears throat> and that was a, not the nail in the coffin, but it was certainly uh, getting that coffin ready for the end of the Silver Age. I'd I'd say, I'd say that, w I'd say, I'd say it was certainly the straw because I remember I do remember hearing that that story was very well received and the co and the code got a lot of flack mm. for the fact that they tried to prevent that story from coming to light. Yeah, um, but not to get too far off on on this tangent. Um, so one of the things that uh, I've talked about in the past is like what, what they're defining as supers. I, I tend to call people with powers. Mm -hmm. Um. And the the earliest example I can find of that again comes from Marvel. It's it's uh, their New Universe line from the the mid to late nineteen eighties. It it was not well received. They tried to revive it in the two thousands with New Universal, um, but um, the, it it was more of um, like when I think of it, it's it's like stories like uh, Heroes or Misfits, where it's not necessarily let's put on a cape and save the world but these powers have now complicated our lives mm -hmm. um there was a, a game from white wolf uh and i think it was recently redone by onyx press or or another company uh aberrant which kind of rides that line of are you people with powers or are you trying to be superheroes right um i enjoyed aberrant it's really good <clears throat> it did a d20 version too same, Abbott was excellent. You know, if you go back to Gladiator by Philip Wiley, the very first, uh, quote, Supers book that I'm aware of, 1930, mm. uh, it's actually not superhero, it's Supers. He has essentially all of the powers of Golden Age Superman, but he doesn't really put on a costume and, and solve crime. He kind of wanders the world, a lost soul, trying to figure out what he should do with these powers, and it's, it's a very tragic book. And... Um, uh, there's also wild card. It's a good example. Oh yeah. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm now. Yeah, know. and if if we continue like that, there's also a lot of manga and anime where uh, where they go in the supers uh, line. You know, the characters don't have super uh, super costumes or secret identities. Mm -hmm. but they have powers and they affect their lives. Something now. Um, 
Oh, I'm, I'm getting. Oh, I'm not sure who. Not sure who it is, but somebody's giving me an echo. Okay, testing one two. Not hearing the echo. <laughs> sorry, sorry about. Sorry about that, Dave. Um, going going further going further into that. Um, while the and this is the, this is the big this is the other reason why I um why I ta why I wanted to tackle the supers and um superheroes distinction is. When you when we look at a lot of um, a lot of a lot of super, a lot of superhero um, media and supers media, um, you have you have kind of a you have kind of a Frankenstein of all, of all these different genres and subgenres that the idea of of comic book gaming has integrated into itself over over the past over the past few decades, and how and that br that brings me to. I'd, I'd like you to go. I'd like you all to go into the challenge of trying to, a of trying to accompany, a a wide net of of those kind of things. And granted, for, granted, <laughs> unfortunately, in this case, I'd say, Christian, you had you had the you had the easiest run of it because you were going for something specific. <laughs> <laughs> right. But. There's always the there's always the I know I talk about analysis paralysis a lot, but there's always the question of overwhelming when it comes to um, all the all the stuff that superhero games and superhero game modules can be. So the so the question that the question that I have for all, for all of you is how is how do you make sure that 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 um that doesn't get too overwhelming? Well, I totally failed on that regard. My book ended up being 496 pages long. <laughs> that's still 200 so, less than Hero, so you, so you, um, <laughs> progress. That's right. That's right. Uh, you know, it's funny. I set out trying to make a generic superhero RPG um, that was physics based, so uh, it could model essentially any sort of um, superhero power mm -hmm. as long as there was some way to model it in the physical world. Which ended up being not as universal as I expected, because there are some powers that really um, are very meta. So, you know, my power is I can wish for anything, but it always goes wrong in the worst way. Like, you, there's really no way you can model that with rules as physics. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing I found out is that as I was working on the game, everybody was like, oh, yeah, that's interesting. What's the backstory? I'm like, there's, there's no backstory. It's a it's a superhero, you know, game, game mechanic system so that you can build your own super world. And... Uh, even my biggest fans on my Discord were like, yeah, I think you really need a backstory. So I ended up having to create a superhero universe to sell my generic superhero game and, uh, and ended up getting lots of positive feedback about the, um, the superhero universe. So I just, I just know at some point someone's going to tell me that they've adapted my superhero universe to play with champions and then I'm just going to fall on my sword in despair um, or glee. I'm not, sure what, I'm not sure how I would feel about that. But anyway, long story short, very hard to make a generic superhero game um, because superhero comics and movies don't even really agree on themselves. And my attempt led to 496 pages, and I still failed to be generic. <laughs> so I have a question for you. For... Would it be better or worse if they converted it to GURPS? <laughs> right? <laughs> 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 no! I, you know, I, I, I honestly don't even know how I would feel. Um, I mean, GURP Supers is a great game, but I think, you know, Ascendant is designed to be able to play more at, like, the <laughs> Thor or Superman level, and I always felt like GURP Supers did better at, you know, the Batman Daredevil level, so. And Yeah, there's a there's an a economy of scale, or not economy of scale, there, there's an issue with scaling up power in, in GURPS, or at least the last time I, I played GURPS, you... Once you, you, you start trying to model a character like the Hulk, it just kind of breaks down. <laughs> uh, that was what I found, too. I had the same experience. You know. um, of course, there's also, there's also the fact that once you're modeling high-powered um, high characters with GURPS, you need a much, 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 much bigger character sheet. Hell, I, can't e I cannot use the <laughs> default character sheet for Conan. Right. So imagine how impossible it would be to try and to try and do say Thor using using right. GURPS. 
Yeah, but then my system is so much, is so much easier then because everything's just basically point by infusion system. Yeah, which is modeled after Green One and Mutants and Masterminds. Mm -hmm. Um, but that brings up an interesting thing when it comes when it comes to when it comes to power scaling because in a in a role playing game naturally. The most common form of reward is some form of experience, whether that's experience for a leveling system, or exp or experience as a, as a currency so that people can buy um, advancements themselves. But whenever you but whenever that's done, it's very it's very easy to um, to end up escaping whatever whatever tier that they, that they were that they were at. Or, or whatever tier that that the adventure is supposed to be, much like much like how in a um, in a fantasy role playing game you go you go for you go from the you go from the low level swords for swords for hire to de to demigods if somebody's doing epic level rules, <laughs> and the and the trick the tricky question is how do you um how do you ma how do you maintain street level to be street level over a long-term campaign so I, I can address that for metahumans rising at least um one of the things that so so we kind of walk this this tightrope between um traditional advancement and narrative concepts mm -hmm. <clears throat> and you can advance in a diverse sense without like making numbers bigger right um <clears throat> so you you have a a larger toolbox to work from but you you're no you're not going to get to the point where you know i i went from being like i'm the guy with guns superhero punisher guy or or uh, red hood to my guns now take down uh galactus or superman or, or whatever it is it's more that I have this tool set that I can pull from that is much more eclectic, right? Mm -hmm. I have options available to me that just weren't there before. Um, with the infusion and um, by extension M and M, the best part I like about um, the power level system is that you can separate experience away from power level. Um, you can still give them, um, you know, points to enhance their characters, but you can still live and by, and also keep the, the power level limit so that they don't um, go over that power level, even though they can have more um, points associated with those with that power level. So you can keep. You can keep the destructive capabilities quite low, um, even though giving them a vast uh, more capabilities in, in, you know, in the interim. So I think that's also a very nice way of, of having a uh, reward system um, to keep game balance down. Mm -hmm. We adopted a similar system to the to mutants and masterminds for Ascendant. Uh, forever, you can accumulate character points to improve your character. And then, if the if the uh, GM wants to, every forty character points or so, he can increase your power level. Um, but you can also just continue to diversify. So it seems like we all hit on essentially the same solution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I only wrote um, infusion because um, I got tired of the wasted, you know, points of of M and M. I just found that it was so, uh, you know, so much fat. So I tried to trim the fat, and then, mm -hmm. um, you know. And the only thing that's the only reason why I wrote Infusion. That's the only reason. You end up creating your own setting for Infusion? I'm I'm currently in the process of it at the moment, yes. So because right. okay. I also ran into problems like you did. Everyone wants to know what the backstory is. Yeah, you know, it's a little bit depressing sometimes to be a game designer when you realize that what actually sells product is really beautiful cover art and interior art and the backstory. And, um, you know, a, a lot of people almost don't even pay attention to the game design. There was, a, I think, a $250,000 Kickstarter that just launched for an Afrofuturist RPG, and they didn't actually have a game system. It was just the promise of the setting and the art. And, uh, you know, when you're, if you're someone like me, and I, I would assume like you guys, um, you know, and you really enjoy the, the actual art of game design and streamlining mechanics and balancing the points. 
sort of like fight it's 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 sort of like fighting out you're you're the you know you're the dog of the family i I, remember I feel you. i feel like an, i feel like an outsider because uh, i'm uh, i'm more a storyteller than a game designer <laughs> no i didn't create my own uh, rpg system i used savage worlds for uh, main setting titan effect mm -hmm. and converting titan effect to other uh, rule system like you don't and masterminds mm -hmm. Doesn't make you an outsider. That makes you smarter than us. <laughs> <laughs> or at least less more masochist. I, I won't go that far, but I take that <laughs> compliment. We've we've all we've all delved into some into 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 game design in one in one form or another. So I don't think I don't think any of us have any right to be throwing stones in the glass house about who's a masochist and who isn't. <clears throat> Um, I like the I like the game design. I like figuring out where things go and how they work. It's mm -hmm. it's quite it's quite interesting. Um, you know, uh, I've been tinkering with the rules. Well, I've been tinkering with the D twenty rules now for what twenty years, twenty two years, eh? You, mm -hmm. it's quite quite fun. It's quite interesting. Just, and also, when you take things away, okay, you actually see the snowball effect. It's really interesting. Mm -hmm. Now, the other the other um. The other issue, the other issue that can happen with with um, with storytelling with supers is, unlike unlike standard standard characters in a role playing game, if you if you look at um, if you look at the if you look at the story arc in any superhero trade paperback, ever, um, even even long even long form ones, there isn't really a whole lot of upgrading that's go that's going on. More often than not. We see side grading, where where somebody somebody ends up get somebody ends up getting a new a um a certain set of tools for a cer for a specific problem or a certain a certain new power set for a for a for a certain amount of time. Looking at you, black suit Spidey, um, <laughs> or or some. But the key word is the these things are not are not really more powerful, just just temporarily different, um. So the qu the question that I have for you all is how do you how do you integrate something how do you integrate something like that within you, within your relative frameworks b while still while it's still feeling like a reward even if it's going to only be a reward over an arc. Um, I took a feather obviously out of um M and M and I used uh, heroic actions okay which allow you to edit a edit the, the game um as you see fit okay within reason um and then you also got extra effort which allows you to push yourself um further than you normally would in exchange for fatigue and then you could also use your heroic actions to overcome that fatigue um which is quite nice uh you know um i came up with a a, a different leveling system um for strength and, and the capabilities of um, you know, and, and time measurements. So um, compared to your know, Green Ronin's version, mm -hmm. and um, yeah, it's it's nice little. Uh, you get a nice little bump. Um, whereas my system is a little bit more defined, where theirs is more open ended. Mm -hmm. So I, I want to just look at the the Black Suit Spider Man for a second. Mm -hmm. Uh, and and really, a lot of that is a reflavoring of his existing powers, right? If I, I remember correctly, there there wasn't a, a major shift until he realized he was like losing control. Um, and the way I would probably handle that in Metahumans Rising is through the use of drives, which are a, a way of expressing motivations. But they can be something like. Um, uh, push yourself too far, go overboard, right? Don't let them get away with it. Mm -hmm. And that rewards you with willpower, which allows you to push your abilities even further than what they're capable of normally. Um, and so I, I would run that arc with this kind of mischievous or, or uh, malicious drive uh, on the character. And then uh, when he decides to purge himself, uh, get rid of the suit... Um, I let him swap that out as kind of a reward. He actually gets to pick his own, or the player gets to pick their own drive. 
uh, and, and you know, again, it's it's about expanding options, right? You're not necessarily more powerful, but now you have this new motivation that can help draw strength from. Uh, and then I get to make villain uh, a new villain uh, from Venom. So yeah, and I I I. I... I specific I specifically brought up the um, bl the black suit Spider Man because that's one of that's one of the most famous that's one of the most famous examples of this kind of thing. But you look but you look throughout um, various various legacy characters throughout co throughout comics and and various heroic characters, and you can you kind of find this sort of this sort of su this sort of sudden s upgrade or side grade rather than rather than a gradual affair. But um, with the way with the way the format of role playing games tends to work, it's favoring more of a gr more of a gra more of a gradual aff more of a gradual affair rather than rather than sudden jumps. So, so to address that more specifically, um, we can talk about cosmic suits or cosmic Spider Man, right? Mm -hmm. Where he's just like operating on this insane level. Um, one of the things that we do, we we have predefined power levels for when you make your character and um, we have a, a system in place for you to have like a mixed tier party mm -hmm. um, so like if you want to do Batman and Robin you might have a, a low powered and a classic level hero just to represent you know that Robin is still in training or whatever power level you decide to make Batman right? I, I'm not going to get out of conversation mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> but um Along with that, <clears throat> you can take that same system and say, okay, uh, you may have a, a classic hero, but we're going to tell this cosmic level tale, and you are infused with this energy, and so I'm going to use that same mechanic to scale you up for the course of this story arc. Mm -hmm. Right Now, it'll go away at the end of the arc, right? but for this time, being, this time period, you're operating at this higher level. right? Mm -hmm. uh, enjoy it and, and do fun things with it. Yeah. Right, and it, it's just a matter of manipulating how much willpower the character has and how much they gain for doing certain actions. Mm -hmm. Right, and as I mentioned earlier, like this allows you to push yourself beyond your normal limits, so you actually feel that in the actions that they're taking. Right, they can push more willpower into it. They can do bigger things. Mm -hmm. They feel a lot more powerful at that point. Yeah. And then we take it away. Now, I want to shift into uh, since we since we talked about the ho the whole. Um, the whole thing of the whole thing of of needing a setting or or needing ba needing backstory, um, I do want I do want to touch on that kind of thing because, as I mentioned earlier on, um, the whole supers thing can t can take a vast multitude of um of forms, so when tr so when trying to cr when, even when trying to create a generic, so. With e so with each of the worlds that you ended up creating that's associated with your particular rule set, um, what steps did you make sure to do to make sure that you guys didn't get lost in the weeds as far as what it's supposed to be? So I, uh, if anyone wants to go over before me, please feel free to speak up. Otherwise, I'll, I'll keep rambling on here. Um, <clears throat> so for Metahumans Rising, uh, we we originally developed a, a larger kind of a history starting uh, around World War One, uh, and developed this this world of superheroes. Um, but then, like Kickstarter happens, and, and you have to face some like real world challenges uh, of like page count, <laughs> and a lot of our setting ended up getting stripped out. But um, or, or, or sidelined, um, but what we what we did in the development phases was we looked at what are the beats that we want to have in the present world, right? Uh, what what are the iconic things that we want to be able to define? And it, by focusing on what is iconic and and how we got to that point, we were able to prioritize what what was going in there. And uh, you know portions of that actually carry forward into the the book, even though we had to remove a, a large portion of the the setting for *Red Hills Rising*. Mm -hmm. I yeah, that's a similar, similar approach for a *Titan Effect*, because uh, there's a lot of um, of alternate history, and uh, it takes place in present day. 
So I had to figure what was the mood and what was the specifics that I wanted in the present day. Mm -hmm. to, uh, so I had to find all the elements to make it work. I remember initially started the, the universe. It was more diverse. There was a lot of stuff like a, a regular uh, superhero uh, universe mm -hmm. with magic and all uh, that kind of stuff. And uh, it felt wrong because I wanted something grounded. So I, uh, I tightened all that and, uh, you know, I removed all the fat, everything that didn't work to, uh, to have something that was more, uh, you know, more natural. Ascendant, we decided to have the backstory begin in the present day. So circa 2018, there are no known superheroes and everything is happening right now in the present. And so the entire backstory is presented as a series of uh, internet articles, tweets, uh, Facebook posts, Reddit, etc. Uh, almost like an epistolary novel. Mm -hmm. And it all you know, it all happened starting 2012 with a teeny little hint, tip of the iceberg type stuff, and then it progresses to uh, 2019. And the the game, uh, the game world ostensibly begins, uh, you know, January 2021, um, with uh, the first generation of superheroes have just appeared. And I wanted to do that because I wanted to explore um, how people would react if superhuman. Uh, beings appeared in the present day, given the popularity of Marvel movies and DC comics and things like that. Um, you know, wh when they created um, The Walking Dead, uh, the guy who created The Walking Dead said that The Walking Dead world is exactly like our world, except George Romero didn't ever make zombie movies. And so the people in The Walking Dead didn't know what zombies were when the zombie apocalypse began. And so that explains why they were caught off guard, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to do with Ascendant was explore the opposite notion of what if super beings become real in a world where people have been talking about super beings for 75 years in comic books without ever having any. And uh, and, and, and my hypothesis is that uh, art would shape reality and people would dress up and act like superheroes and supervillains because that's what they've been conditioned to do by the media. I mean, we, we have... Uh... I think they call them reels, which are people that dress up as superheroes and help out in their communities now. Mm -hmm. So yeah. <laughs> I think you might be onto something there. I also did a very similar kind of approach um, where even though supers have been around for a while, okay, they've just become more um, widespread now, especially with current technology um, and, you know, alien invasion and all of that kind of stuff. Um, you know, anything that's prevalent or um, future stories that we could use. Um, so uh, I tried to to come up with a backstory where, um, you know, in World War One and World War Two, there wasn't very many. Um, there was one or two people that were really um, good at doing something specific. And then um, it evolved, okay, whereas uh, you get your Superman characters um, and that kind of stuff. But they get introduced slowly, um, and I, I like it. I also tried to go for the iconic um, you know, characters. Mm -hmm. Now, that br that brings me to one other thing. With a lot, with in the wake of a lot of um, a lot of a lot of supers um, settings that have, that have come that have come about over the over the past, I want to say forty years, give or, give or take. Um, there's always there's there's often been some sort of re some sort of regulatory. Um, organization that that take that that show that shows up in one form or another in some ca in some cases it's some it's more it's on the more authoritarian end and on other ends it's tr it's trying to be an intermediary um but when but when it came to when it came to try when it came to trying to have that's a more organized end of this of the superhero effect within your within your given settings um what kind? What kind of? What kind of aim on that particular spectrum were you? Sh were you um, particularly shooting for? I came up with a solution I thought was hilarious, which was I decided that the superheroes were part of the Coast Guard, <laughs> because 
<laughs> because the Coast Guard is the only part of the U.S. government that is both a law enforcement agency and also an armed service that can be deployed internationally under the Department of Defense. And so it's a way to have them be part of the military and be able to operate overseas, but also able to operate domestically under posse comitas. Also, the Coast Guard gets no respect. So the idea that the most powerful man in the world is part of the Coast Guard just makes me laugh endlessly every time I think about it. I'm hoping I can get a Coast Guard sponsorship for the game. <laughs> brilliant. That's brilliant. Mm -hmm. I like that idea, too. Very good. Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Oh. I have a... Oh, sorry. Did you want to go? No, go, no, no. go ahead. Um, I have a very similar organization um, to S.H.I.E.L.D., um, but I've kind of amalgamated S.H.I.E.L.D. and Checkmate into one. Um, so they kind of, they oversee, they're not author, author, um, you know, author, uh, yeah, Authority, I'm going to start Authoritarian. With, yeah. <laughs> Authoritarian. I'm going to start with that, with that word. Um, it's, they're not so much where they want to be in control of everything. Is it what they want to do is that they just want to protect themselves um, from the worst kind of people. So that's the reason why they would recruit um, you know, something like shield. Okay. But with a uh, checkmate kind of hierarchy structure. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, I know um, Christian, I know that I know that Spear is a bit is a is a major player when it comes when it comes to the setting of Titan Effect. So, yes, uh, in in Titan Effect, it's a bit different than uh, than most uh, super uh, settings because uh, psychics who are basically uh, metahumans are secret. Uh, their existence is an, is an, is only known by a few people in the world. So some secret societies, uh, criminal organizations, some people in the government. So they are used basically as uh, as proxy soldiers or spies, because uh, due to their abilities, they can do all kinds of stuff that regular soldiers or spies can do, obviously. And uh, so you have different factions that use them for different purposes. And the main uh, the players, Titan Effect, work for the that is basically the good guys. So it's a bit like the shield, but more, uh, I would say, more underdog version. They're secret, they're hunted by other organizations, they don't have any legal existence, so they try to protect the world and at the same time protect the secrecy of the organization. Mm -hmm. So we ask the, the character, the players, to uh, to use their abilities only when then, when necessary or when there's no uh, uh, witnesses, mm -hmm. so it's it's in it's a back it's in the background that it causes a limitation in the game because the players can't use their abilities any way they want. For example, someone who can control fire can't throw fire balls in the middle of a city with uh, a lot of witness mm -hmm. because there would be repercussion for him and the organization. It's a very world of darkness, really. Yeah, there's a uh, there's a bit of that. Uh, I used to play a lot of World of Darkness when I, I started role playing games, so I think it had uh, some inspiration and influence uh, on me. Yeah, I was a very big. Uh, I'm a very big superhero fan. I mean, I like the larger than life um, iconic kind of characters, and I think that's the reason why um, I was chosen to go more that way. But I also like the Marvel Cinematic um, Universe where you. You have some form of function as well as um, form um, compared to regular superheroes. Which does br does bring me to to uh, some to something that has been has been an un has been a un has been an unfortunate trend when it comes to when it when it comes to when it comes to super when it comes to superheroes. Um, and just su and su and um, superhero fiction, especially especially on the larger end, not so much on the indies, and that is um, a with a lot with a lot of um, with a lot of games. There's more there's more of a focus on the on the powers and less on the act of being um, superheroes. And 
one thing that I'm one thing that I'd be curious to pick your to pick your respective brains on is how how that tide can be potentially stemmed. Can you explain a little bit the question more? I don't fully think I get it. Um, it ha- it has it has more to do with the with the fact that we've seen we've seen a lot more um, on the cathar- on the cathartic end, uh, or at least an idea of the cathartic type of super, type of super inst- instead of instead of the aspirational. And so, now it could it could be argued that that, that the latter is e- is easier to, is easier to write for a gr- for a group, but how do you how do you how do you um how do you maintain the the more aspirational type of he- type of hero with while still while still keeping it engaging so that's an interesting question but i think as a game designer mm-hmm. like it, unless you're going to handhold the the setting and, and provide rules to to make that happen that's that's largely dependent on the table right um, so we can provide them a setting that is uplifting, right? Or them being the players and, and GMs that are, are playing these games, we we can, we can give them this setting that is uplifting. But if those are the stories they want to tell, where it's you know the only person you're really saving is yourself, um, more power to them. Uh, one of the things that we do is is we have a, a step zero in character creation, where everyone kind of sets out like this is what I see our story being about or our campaign being about, and these are the things that we want to explore. So we can at least, as a group or as a table, say we're all on the same page for the overarching story, Mm -hmm. right? Like, you know, whatever happens during the campaign will happen in the campaign, but we know that we want to see these types of things. And if if it's inspirational and and uplifting, you know, we're going to note that, up front and make sure that uh, we as a group and not just the GM are, are pushing towards those types of stories. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, go for it, go for it. I was going to say, I, I have a theory in game design that players will tend to do more of whatever you provide rules for. So the way I handled trying to get people to act like aspirational heroes was I had a section of the game called Saving the Day and I provided a bunch of rules mechanics for um, doing actual disaster relief, emergency relief, hostage negotiation, bomb threats, dealing with a tsunami, dealing with an earthquake, dealing with a fire, blah, 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 blah. And so um, I found that, you know, if people could show off their cool powers by using the game mechanics that are available to save the day, they're more likely to save the day and be kind of aspirational Superman types. Mm-hmm. That's interesting. Like, including some way to mitigate disasters like very important like when we were designing mechanics that was something that was like on the front of my mind that we wanted to make sure that it's not just about punch in face it's about save people from burning building stop the meteor from hitting the earth that sort of stuff yeah the, so I, I... yeah getting re- getting rewards um you know that are not just based on experience but your um, things that you're capable of doing, okay, where once you've stopped the tsunami and so forth and so forth, you get the good of heroic actions, um, which allow you to edit the scene um, or gain temporary alternates or power stunts, which is also a nice little way of, of you know, making sure that the, the players can um, be heroic. One of the things that I like to do with Titan Effect is to... Um create situations where the characters have to choose between saving the day and making the wrong decision or trying to stay uh, true to their uh, moral code. So there's a lot of, uh, of situations in adventures or even in, in the mini campaign that I wrote for Titan Effect where the, the players sometimes have to choose a lesser evil or try to stay true to their, uh, to their ideal. So this can create, you know, very interesting situations. I think. Mm-hmm. Now, take now uh, with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind. I um, the yesterday was yesterday I had on um the guy the um Crit Academy the guy behind um the upcoming project Capes and Crooks, and I had br- and I had brought up I had brought up a um 
a bit of a, a bit of a a bit of a question that's always been an elephant in the room for me when it comes to soup when it comes to supers designs that I call the magic question <laughs> because when you look when you look at a lot of when you look at a lot of sup supers games um inevitably somebody wants to do their own spin on Constantine or Doctor Strange or the, or some sort of magician type but the but magic is often treated as a as an almost a do anything attribute since tr obviously since trying to do a, a proper spell list is um pointless but how have, how have you how have you indiv how have you individually approached the concept of magic or psionics without ma without making it so it's so it's a u so it's a universal substitute so for Metahumans Rising, one of the things that we express is what's on your character sheet is just the starting place, mm -hmm. and willpower is what lets you go in the direction you see fit as the character. So when you're building your power, you're, you're not constrained to what you've listed out in the power, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that works for um, the Human Torch, because I don't want you to like have to figure out like every way to introduce... like fire cages and supernova and all this other stuff like we know that you're going to do some fire stuff and sometimes it's going to get weird right mm -hmm. same thing with dr strange we're going to we're going to outline some basic like these are the go-to powers and then you use willpower and get weird with it yeah it, it, fusion does something very similar where um you've got your your point system uh, you buy your powers but you're not technically limited to what those powers are because um basically you could have any kind of power um, which is based off an effect system. So if you have a damage that does, you know, a substantial amount of damage, it could be bio-based, it could be magic-based, it doesn't matter really because the effect is what's the most important. Um, so and then you just add the descriptors, um, you know, to those capabilities, those effects. Um, and that's what describes what those effects are. So if something is magic, for instance, then Superman um, will obviously be damaged more by the magic effect but if it's fire-based then he's pretty much invulnerable um, to it so that's how you know the difference between um being mundane magic uh, or superheroic or what elemental based or you know um, energy based mm -hmm. now with that, with that kind, with that kind of thing in, with that kind of thing in mind, um, I want, I want to shift back to, to the, um, ca to the concept of, es of escalation, um, because we talked, we talked about the, pl we talked about the player facing, end of, e end of escalation within, within, um, within a campaign, but I'd like to, I'd like to discuss the, GM side of, um, es of escalation, in order because. Obviously, the obviously the one thing that no GM wants is to reve to reveal their to reveal their big bad and that and then because of because of how candy the players have been with their creation, end up end up curb stomping the the big bad evil guy. <laughs> so, what I'm mm -hmm. what I'm curious about is how, is how you is how you guys have 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 attempted to maintain a. A, le a degree of levelness so so that so that when the so that when that encounter does come it's not it's not a it's not a one turn one and done I, i'm still uh -huh. new um at what so i will defer to everyone else <laughs> uh, so here. yeah go ahead oh, go ahead, oh, go ahead. Okay. um so for Metahumans Rising, uh, again, we, we have the, the power scales, but we, we made sure that damage is divorced from, like, accuracy. Uh, so one, just because you're, you're, you have a, a higher power value does not mean you're going to instantly, like, blow up the world, right? Uh, and then two, um, willpower, giving the, the villains, or the big bad villain... More willpower allows them to um, interrupt people's actions more frequently, or, or interact and and recover, um, and just pull off the kind of stunts that you see in comic books. 
uh, that allow Doctor Doom to take on the entire Fantastic Four and not just get curb stomped, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, and that, that that was really one of the the things that we wanted to do is like you don't you shouldn't have to have a host of minions sitting in front of your bad guy unless that's the bad guy shtick, right? Mm-hmm. And we we wanted to be able to account for both styles of play. Sure, sure. Uh, so, Ascendant, it's pretty hard to curb stomp someone in one round if they're close to your power level, and very, very hard if they're above your power level. Uh, we use a bunch of different mechanics. One is rolling with the attack, where you can reduce the effect of an attack by taking conditions. So you can um, you can have damage by becoming dazed, for instance, or you can take one quarter damage by becoming staggered. You can then use hero points to break out of the conditions. Um, you can use hero points to do emergency power stunts uh, to react to an unexpected situation that otherwise might take you out of the fight. Um, and so it, it ends up being that there's really three tracks of uh, attrition. There's a hero point track, a health track, and a determination track. Mm-hmm. And you can take a character out of the fight more or less by eliminating them in any of the three tracks. And different players will have different uh, approaches. So. Uh, a psychic character is going to tend to drain you with uh, determination. A slugger is going to be going for your health. And then someone who does a lot of um, conditions and effects, uh, non-damaging conditions, is going to end up draining your hero points the most because you've got a break three of this or emergency power stunt that. And um, the net result, we've done everything from um, you know fights against one big bad at a very high power level to uh, group on group, five on five battles to five heroes versus you know the Iraq army, and you know they all play out with the average fight lasting five to six rounds uh, for for an even uh, even challenge rating. Mm-hmm. Now, when it now um, obvi- obviously when it went within any game's development, it all it's all roads le- all roads lead to play testing and. Since each, since each of you have been playtesting your your own pro, your own projects to a, to a not to a not insignificant degree, I'd be curious what some of the big um what some of the what some of the bigger and some of the harsher lessons that you ended up learning during um during play, during playtesting and some of the things that were a were a case of neat of not of not quite thinking through not quite thinking through the consequences of something. For instance, well, I think the, there's one thing that uh, come up uh, a lot, and uh, even uh, as a game master on the on a lot of different RPGs, whatever you haven't thought about, the players will do it. You you can be prepared as much as you want. You can try to to design. Any rule you like, the, the way you want, but there's always a moment when players do some crazy stuff of thing that you haven't thought about, and that you know that can break the game. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's one of the great perks of playtesting, and that, that's absolutely mandatory. Is because if you don't do it, your uh, your design won't be tested by the players, and uh, you can have some really bad surprise uh, once you release your game. Yeah, I had the uh, interesting experience of having a um, uh, a min maxer like rules lawyer as part of my playtest, or a couple actually. But um, uh, one of the things they, they found it very frustrating because they kept looking for exploits, um, and every time they they thought they uh, they had found something. Uh, we had a, a design that was robust enough that, well, well okay, if that's the direction you want to go, this is what we can do to challenge that character, right? And, but it, it's very much a, you have to try and find the holes to know if they're there or not. I, I was fortunate to have a couple maniacs in my playtesting group um, <laughs> that went places I just never imagined and found some loopholes that I think I would not have otherwise spotted. Like, you know, we had one guy who noticed that I had let growth be unrestricted by power level. And so he ended up building a character that was two two miles tall 
And then he took a, uh, a very low-end aura effect, um, which aura is basically like, you know, people nearby you take damage. Mm -hmm. But since he was two miles tall, everything was nearby him, so he could just sort of take out an entire city by just hovering over it. Uh, <laughs> You know, I, I, people like that are so indispensable for the game design process, and there's no way to avoid just handing the system over to them and then watch them destroy everything you've built and then, uh, you know, setting up the dominoes again and doing it again. And, you know, we ended up doing, I think, 42 different uh, versions of the rules uh, in the process of going through all the playtesting before I think we fixed most of the, uh, most of the potential bugs and flaws and loopholes and min-max cheese. Douglas Adams would be proud of that number. Yes, yes. Stopped at 42. Probably could have gone on. There's probably still stuff in there, but, you know, at least you can't be two miles tall with a 5.0 R and wipe out the planet now. That sounds like fun. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of fun, right? You know. Um. The, the, oh. oh. Go ahead. I was going to say, there was like an older version of Champions that just, in the back of the book, listed off concepts of like, yeah, you could do this stuff, but like, don't do not do this stuff. Right? Like the guy who, who took shrinking, and uh, but usable on others, and so he would just shrink planets down to the size of marbles and throw them at you, and turn off his shrinking as they hit you. <laughs> uh, like, nutty stuff like that. Uh, and so, like, I'm definitely getting those vibes from from your your giant with aura there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. The difference is, champions basically took the took the choice of yeah, we don't care, just don't do it, even though it's possible. I did try and adjust the game to make it at least more difficult. Yeah, I think yeah. it's. Oh, go ahead. I think it's a it's good uh, if you have a good GM. Okay, then that is very important uh, because. You know, they have to be able to fly off the pants of their seat, uh, the seat of their pants, sorry, um, to actually, you know, control their players or at least um, manipulate their players in a subtle way. Mm -hmm. Now, speak, yeah, that's true. Speaking of that, speaking, um, well, actually, um, <laughs> Chris, Christian, did you have, did you have any experience on, on that? Because, um, because I I know that I know that you um. You would still, even though you're using um, Savage Worlds, you still you still had to do your fair share of play testing. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. But um, no, th there's something that's great with Savage Worlds, a uh, superpowers companion, is that unlike uh, mutant and masterminds or hero system, when the the powers or a catch-all, it you, you can do all kind of crazy stuff. In Savage World, it's more. I would say grounded and uh, and limited, so the, the the players can, you know, can stray away too much from uh, from the rules and do a thing that uh, that normally they, they can't possibly do. Uh, all right, I can I can I can certainly see I can certainly see that, and I know um there there I know that there was a bit of a scramble when <laughs> when you. When um suede, when suede came about, on your end. Yeah, that was uh, that was. I had a really bad timing because uh, when I released uh, the the setting, uh, suede came up, and uh, you know I had to make a conversion document. But uh, a lot of people have been asking me when I will be rele releasing uh, a new update, a new edition for suede. And uh, sadly, I had to. Uh, I'm still waiting for the new superpowers companion to uh, to come up. Mm -hmm. Eventually, uh, it will happen. <laughs> so it's a case of pe of people asking you when when a when a second edition of t of Titan Effect using Swade's rules will come will come about, and you're just waiting for Swade's version of the superpower companion. Yeah, that's also why I started to work on the conversion for uh, Mutants and Masterminds. And I've been asked to uh, make a, a demo for a new uh, superhero games using uh, Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition, oh, superhero yeah. or uh, Fifth Edition. Yeah, I know about so, that one. S S Five E. Yeah. Oh. 
So we'll see uh, what happens. If people like the demo, uh, well, maybe, maybe there will be a full conversion. Mm -hmm. um, if you're looking at other systems, have you looked at doing like a, a PBTA version? I'm not very familiar with it. I heard about it. Uh, I know City of Mist is a, is a good example that has been using it, and I think that they tweaked a lot of the rules. But I, I should, I need to play it first to uh, to see if it's possible or not because uh, I really don't have any experience with with that system. I'm also quite a bit um, lackluster on experience with other systems, um, mostly because I came from South Africa, where we only had a very small selection of, of games to play from. Uh, now, the with the, with that with that kind of thing in with that kind of thing in mind, that um that do, that does that does bring the interesting thing of um. Of con of conversion, because I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure each of you have gotten the question about um, conver converting the converting s the, some of the material that you have to other systems in one in one form or another. And I'm not I'm not saying I'm not saying any anybody to anybody do that because um because because uh, obviously that's a that's a lot bigger of an undertaking at the best of times than than people think, but when it came when it came to when it comes to the idea of conversion whether it be conversion from an existing system into your own handmade setup or convert or converting from one set of rules to another set of rules um i'd like you to go into some of the obstacles that you had to in, that you had to deal with in the process of that well as i'm currently uh, in that process uh, i can say the, the main obstacle is to stay true to the rule system that you're converting your uh, your setting, because it's easy to try to force the system to fit everything in your setting, but you can break the the, the, the you can break the game and uh, and then you know a lot of fans of the game can come uh, right at you and uh, say that you uh, <laughs> you broke their game they don't like it so uh, and for me I I try to adapt the setting toward the new rules to, to find a, a balance between the the setting and the and the rule system mm -hmm. uh, yeah uh, it, it, um with the conversion from because i also do a bit of conversion from the uh what's it pathfinder and dungeon dragon especially on creature sides to my system mm -hmm. and i think the most important thing is um is to Stay true to the flavor of of the actual conversion while um, you know using whatever system that you are going to convert to. Um, so, like my scale, my strength scale, for instance, is a, is a lot smaller. Um, I mean, I only go from for a normal human from um, one to twenty. Okay, whereas uh, a normal human for like D and D and Pathfinder or something is like one to thirty. I mean, they can have. Uh, quite a lot of big higher modifiers but i've squished mine down because i want my superhumans to be um somewhat more stronger than that so that's i have given humans a you know defined thing so i've tried to keep everything true to the feel of um what i'm converting to um instead of being okay just try and make everything fit into the way i want it to fit And I, I can cer I can certainly uh, I can certainly see that I can certainly see that um, now as a as a bit of a ca as a bit of a capstone to the, to this ca to this kind of thing um, I now I'd a I had asked you I'd asked you all something similar to this when, when I had ha when I had each of you on the sh on the show individually but I'd like I'd like you to I I'd, I'd like to um get get your respective perspective on the overall appeal of of um pl of playing a superhero with or or either super or a pow or a powered character and whichever whichever you prefer but what do you th what do you think it is that draws people 
to that st to that style of play. Uh, I can, I'll answer this one. You guys, one of the things I think is important that tabletop RPGs are played in groups, and so you need to have niche protection. Uh, for instance, it's really hard to have a great Wild West role-playing game because everyone's a gunslinger, and it, it feels very samey. Superheroes offer uh, probably the broadest number of different types of archetypes of any RPG, even broader than fantasy, and I think that makes them really appealing. Um, and then when you combine uh, you know, the admiration that we have for them in pop culture, uh, it becomes a really escapist, enjoyable thing where you can get together with your friends, each of you can be totally different, and yet you're all still heroes and can all do heroic things. Nailed it. Yeah, I, I just have to agree with that sentiment. Mm -hmm. Um, it's not, um Guthrie, it sounded like you were sounded like you were going to say bef before um before um Alec, yeah. before Alex jumped. Yeah, he he said he nailed it. He nailed the description. <laughs> <laughs> he, he, got, he, he did, but he nailed it. Uh, it's it's um, superheroes. Uh, as a kid, you know, I grew up reading comics, and that was my escape, escapism. Because I'm dyslexic, um, you know, reading was very difficult for me. So comic books has really uh, brought me out of my shell. And f for me to play those characters and even to tinker with them um, when I'm building them, it's just so satisfying. Okay, and then to be able to go out and do the things that wish you wish you could do in real life. Um, it's it's very satisfying. So mm -hmm. it's very it's very interesting. Uh, I'm even surprised that the first RPG wasn't a superhero game, <laughs> you know, and it yeah. was the. And if you think about it, you know, fantasy games they keep pushing towards being more like superhero games, <laughs> right? When was the last time? It, when was the last time in 5e someone played a human fighter? Yo, yeah, all about. Yeah. So I've only played 5e twice, and I can say 50% of my characters have been human fighters. <laughs> <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. But, but man, yeah. you go out in the new school, and it's like everybody's a tiefling warlock who can fly, and you're like, you're first level, and you can fly. Yeah. What's up? It's funny when you think about it, because uh, back in France, uh, the, the first RPG that I played, most of my friends, when they started their first character, it was always based on the superhero. You know, so when we play Shadowrun, uh, we had a lot of friends trying to imitate superhero uh, characters to Shadowrun. So it was, yep. uh, <laughs> it was really funny. Um. And that it that is it that is a um that it that is a that is a interesting th interesting thing to go, to uh, go down especially since there's been this there's been this comic that's been ma that's been making the rounds for the last week <laughs> in in um in my in my circles of a uh, a party get a party getting to get getting together in a town and um the one person who played a hu who played a human fighter getting picked on by everybody else and quitting. Yes, yes. Um and it is it is very it is very it is very it I'd say I'd say I'd say a lot I'd say a lot of the um a lot of the issue when it comes to when it comes to that kind of thing is because because something like say say D&D &D does the wants to do the whole half in half out attitude about whether or not it even has a setting it's harder to Put to to um build in the implications of being a, of being a certain race within within it. Whereas um if if I'm run if I'm running say the Witcher, um the the uh, Interlock Witcher RPG, and one of my players decides to play as an elf, there's already there's already some connotations about about being an, about being an elf in that setting. That can be that can be played with positively and negatively. Um, if somebody's doing that, if somebody's playing an elf in Warhammer, I can build I can build around that because local elves ruin everything in Warhammer. <laughs> um, but with but there but there isn't that, and that's not to say that's, that's and when I say connotations, I'm not I'm not saying 
fi um, ways for ways for people to um, to bet to have these particular races or particular builds banned, but more of and not more of a gentleman's understanding of if you pick if you pick this, there are going to be certain consequences um, on how on how people see you. Beca because so th this is like I, I mentioned. Sorry, go ahead. Um, just be just because just because of that particular race's um pl place it place in the setting or in or in a given um in a given region. Yeah. Um. Er earlier, I mentioned having a a step zero for character creation, mm -hmm. which is where everyone expresses what their their vision is, and you kind of come to a common collective understanding of both what the world is and, and what the, the characters can uh, the, the shape the characters are going to take and, and one of the things that happens in D&D is a lot of character creation happens in a vacuum right? There, there's no we're all at the table making our characters together or there can be but it's not implicit it's I have a level 1 character and I'm going to sit down at this table now right? Um, and so the, the five of us could all make our characters come sit down and having no prior discussion end up with five identical characters or five radically different characters. Um, and and they have to have a system that will uh, accommodate for that. Mm -hmm. Right? And this is why I just say, like, we formalized having discussion before play. I don't think if you had a, a step zero or session zero with your players and said, okay, well, this is the world that I'm envisioning, and uh, you are free to play this thing, but here's the lore around it, uh, and so you'll see in-game effects, both positive and negative, or you know whatever that shapes out to be. Um, uh, you know, you you would see a a less random bag of characters. Yeah. <laughs> um, if that makes sense. I think. I think. I think. Um. Maybe it's, now in my experience the approach the approach that I've done is whenever I, whenever I set up to do a to do a um, campaign session um, with with my with my usual table um, I will write a I'll write a brief primer about the setting what 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 general um, storytelling motifs are gonna, are going to be there and what and what I ex and what sort of play styles are are going to be expected so if i'm doing something that's investig investigatory focused i'll write out this is a investigation heavy game do not do not make a combat centric character if you do if you do um, there there are going to be con there are going to be consequences for that because you're not going to have as much to do um, i and i and well if i'm if i'm running say L5R it's pretty much built in that i'm going to bring that kind of thing up <laughs> but and then after that, I do a series of because I because we're all we're all in different time zones. I do a series of one on ones where I where I speak with each player to help, to help them coax out their idea into a tangible tangible um, character. Um, but what's interesting when you compare this kind of thing with um, with superheroes is that because uh, because of the fact that if so, if um if that with superheroes there is a bit more there is a bit more of a defined a fine set defined set of ideas say if um if we're if if um if I'm running something where the player characters are affiliated with say shield in one, in one form or another then that's an, that's enough for people to work around the um what they can and can't do or what or what's what they could do with some but would have some consequences, um, and I think I think I think with each of the settings that you guys have put up with your own individual games, there is that inbuilt under inbuilt understanding when it comes to your style of supers. Would that be Would that be a correct assessment on my part? Those early. Yeah, um, pretty much. I think people just need to lighten up um, instead of taking everything so personally um, and have to have, uh, like you, you brought up the elves with their certain connotations. It's, it's just part of the story, you know, mm -hmm. and play along. Don't 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 get caught up in what this, what you think it's supposed to mean and just have fun. That's the most yeah. important thing, I think, is, is, the, is the best, <laughs> well, the best I, thing to do. I, 
I don't discourage I, I don't discourage anyone from play from playing elves in that kind of situation. It's it's just it's more of you if you pl if you're playing an elf, peop some some NPCs are going to be looking at you funny. That's just how it is. I mean, as long as it's part of the the game world, I okay, mm -hmm. and bring the real world into what the game world is doing. It's different different things. But I just like, like I said, I think people just need to to lighten up and really just sit, and, sit at a table and enjoy enjoy the company that you are with and play a game. You forgot the pints. Exactly. Have a beer. <laughs> have a beer. This is it. Hey, it's hey. This is the open bar of the internet. I have to maintain character. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um. But, In her character or blood alcohol level? That is a good question. The answer is yes. It's always yes. <laughs> but with that, with that said, I do, I do want to sincerely thank all of you for take for taking the time out of your out of your schedule to, and braving the hell of time zone juggling to come to come onto the sh come onto the temple and enjoy the madness. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me. Mm -hmm. Any sign. Thank, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And of course, of course, the do of course the doors are always are always open. Whether whether it's to whether it's to discuss why why image is better than Mar why why early image was best image or to ju or to just shit post about dif about different supers <laughs> or or t or to um or to break out the T eighty three when trying to do GURP superheroes again. Nope, nope, nope. <laughs> Try to make a spaceship once the girl. Nope. I think that could be a very good compliment. I mean, if someone wants to convert my system into another game system, or another my campaign setting into another system, that's a compliment because at least you've got a good story, you know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I'm, exactly. and. As far as the converting to GURPS thing, I'm just I'm just fucking around with that. I have no des I have no desire to do that. <laughs> not I'm not dr I'm not drunk enough to have to do with to have to deal with the math of tr of trying to trying to deep dive into GURPS again. I'm not drunk enough to trig. Yeah, I've never played GURPS, so um, or even not even looked at it looked at it. So I'm happy. <laughs> um, GURPS is one of the OGs when it comes to universal style gaming. But um, the thing the thing about being a universal game is that yeah you can do anything, but that comes at a cost. And thanks for cost, having us. <laughs> yeah, thank, thanks. Um. <laughs> um. So, uh, <laughs> I I think if I could sum up GURPS in in a sentence, it's they made sure to include range modifiers for one sixty fourth of an inch. Uh, in one edition, I, I I don't know about later editions, but in the one that I owned, uh, I knew what my bonus was if I was one sixty fourth of an inch away from my target. Mm -hmm. That's curbs. <laughs> oh, but and of and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule um, to come on to come on and listen to uh, us ramp, ramble on for <laughs> for every for everything that we rambled about. <laughs> And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody! <laughs>